welcome everyone to this second in a four-part series uh, taking a, 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 an overview look at the letter of James in the New Testament, a tiny little, a tiny little document in our New Testament, the Christian, uh, the Christian Testament of the Bible, the second in our four-part series. So today I want to talk about two things or focus on two things. One is going to be um, some of the things in this document that are unusual and unlike anything else in the New Testament. And then we'll also spend some time looking at the contents of the first chapter. There's five chapters in this little book. And so we'll want to work through the first chapter and then we'll work through those other four in the next two video series. So some of the things that are um, peculiar, I would say, or um, strange and different, unlike anything else in the New Testament. First of all, we say this is a letter, it's an epistle, um, but the only thing in it that sounds anything like a letter is the first verse, what we call the salutation, uh, where it says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. That would be the equivalent of dear John or dear Jane. So that is about the only thing in, the, in this document that sounds anything like a letter that we would all recognize. There are no uh, extended greetings or references to past events in this opening statement or, or in the concluding parts of it. The way Paul writes his letters, he would often reference other times when he met with them, things that happened at other times, or he would uh, extend words of greeting uh, to to people that he had met in the in the latter part of his his many letters, but you don't get anything like that in the letter of James. Nothing like the way Paul wrote his letters, and no words of of introduction, picking up past conversations or what he really wants to talk about. So it doesn't look like the other letters attributed to, example, Peter or Paul in the New Testament. What it does look like though is sort of like a, what we would call a tract or a simple sermon, a simple sermon that's just put into or written down in words. It follows something we call a diatribe, a diatribe uh, form of, of, of a letter where there's sort of this imaginary questioner that James addresses or the imaginary questioner that asks him uh, questions. Um, rhetorical questions. He'll throw out rhetorical questions. In other, uh, in other words, questions that have obvious answers or no real reason. Um, he also, uh, James will attack uh, certain and specific groups of people. And he often addresses them with really harsh or snarky, snarky words, very, very present. Um, he does not address doctrine about Jesus the way Paul did. That's another reason we think this is a very early document of the early church, because all the, the doctrines about Jesus as Christ and those things that, that Paul spent so much time and energy addressing, they're just not addressed here. They're just not. There is some doctrine, there is some theology, but a lot of this is just pure practical, moral, and ethical uh, uh, guidelines. There is really no evidence, in fact, in James's letter to any awareness of Paul's theology. For example, Paul's concern about how Gentiles, non-Jewish believers, would be uh, welcomed into this new household of faith. Did they have to be circumcised? Those questions, they're just not even addressed here. There's no awareness of that. So that's another reason we think this is a very early document in the church um, because those sorts of issues are just not present. The other interesting thing is that James borrows or, or appears to borrow uh, from other writings. Hebrew Bible, for example, uh, there's, there's several references to the book of Proverbs. Um, Jewish books like Ben Serach, the Book of Wisdom, and some other Jewish writers. 
um, it appears that James was familiar with them, and so you can see snippets of them popping up. He, he was aware of them. There, there are some, uh, there is a strange affinity with some of Paul's letters, uh, particularly Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. There's some phrases that are in James's letter that are also appearing in Paul's letter, but it just simply could be those were some of the new vocabulary of the Christian faith. The greatest parallels of all with the, the book of James is with the first letter of Peter that follows it. First Peter, uh, a remarkable number of verses that are just, that are paralleled. And it makes you wonder, uh, was James borrowing from Peter or did Peter borrow from James? Probably the latter, Peter borrowed from James. But there's just a lot of similar words and phrases and uh, with the, the letter of first Peter. Also, um, Jesus used some of this diatribe style in his sermons uh, on the mount and some of his, his parable, especially with his denunciations. I said James could be snarky. Well, Jesus could be snarky too. And so when it came to his denunciations at times of the scribes and Pharisees, James picks up on this. James must have heard his brother teaching in this way, or it was a very common way to to address these concerns. The other thing is this, is that there are no references to this document anywhere in history until after the second century. It's not referenced. The church fathers don't talk about it. They don't reference it until after the second century. Okay, so a couple hundred years after the death and resurrection of Christ, do we hear references to the letter of James, even though James the Just, the Bishop of Jerusalem, is mentioned in some uh, uh, some uh, antiquities and, and books. He is mentioned, but his letter is not. Um, and then the other uh, thing about I want to mention today is the theological issues and statements. I've said before that it's mostly a moral and ethical guideline, but there is some important theology that is present in this document that shouldn't be mentioned. Now, it's not like Paul's theology where Paul focuses on, on Jesus, on uh, his, his reconciliation and, and salvation schemes. Those are the things that Luther and Calvin loved, and that's probably why they didn't like the letter of James. But there is a lot of theology present. Now, some of the theological issues that James addresses, very important issues. Uh, number one, that ethical and moral behavior has to follow uh, faith, has to follow faith. That faith without those sorts of actions and those sorts of work, works are dead. So it's both, and we'll talk more about that when we get into chapter one. The other thing is that God is pure goodness. God is pure goodness. Okay, and he says this. Um, God does not do evil. There is no evil or darkness in God. And you can hear this in the letters of 1 John. In God there is, is only light, there is no darkness. Because there was some theological thinking among different groups that some aspect of God is dark and evil. But James says that is not the case. In fact, God is not responsible for temptations. God is not responsible for temptations, which is a little bit of a different take than you will get, for example, from the uh, book of Job, what's considered the oldest story in the Hebrew Bible. God does not send temptations. Calamity is not sent from God. Terrible things that happen in the world are not sent from God. They happen. Sin, the, the issue of sin, sin um, does not come from God. God did not create sin. According to James, sin is simply good, something that is good or indifferent that goes bad. Desire, it's when desire for something or the use of something goes bad. 
in the same way that food, food is good, we love food, but yet food can become sinful when we indulge in it, and, or alcohol, or name your addiction. But sin is simply desire gone bad. And here's something that's incredibly important to us in these days of, of um, uh, racial issues uh, that we are all facing. James states clearly, clearly that the image of God is in every human person, not just a person of a particular faith or a particular nationality or race. The image of God is present in all human beings, which was huge for that day. God's image is present in all people, every single person. God's image we call the Imago Dei. It's in, it's in everyone. And then here's the other thing that's so important, and I never realized this, but James shows huge concern for social justice. This is this issue of flattening the curve that I was talking about that is simply not present in Paul's letters. Paul focuses on theology, on Jesus, on salvation schemes, on what all of that means and pays little attention to issues of poverty, race, and those sorts of things. James has clear concern for social justice, that God is concerned not only about the conditions of our interior soul, but also um, the conditions of the world itself, about justice, okay? That's very present in the letter of James and we'll, we'll address that. So those are some of the interesting things about the book of James. It's, it shows this old-fashioned diatribe farm. He does borrow from a lot of old um, ancient Jewish writers and there are a lot of similarities to the letter of first, first Peter. The other thing is that it really doesn't look or sound like a letter at all except for the very first verse. It sounds more like a, 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 a doctrinal or a, a tract of some kind of written sermon. Okay, now let's talk about the first chapter of James. It has five chapters. This is the first chapter. So the first verse out of the gate is the, his greeting where he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So James, obviously, James, he doesn't need to say James, the Bishop of Jerusalem, it was well known who James was. He just uses that name. He, ha he, he makes no claim to any sort of apostolic office. It's just his name. By the way, James is the um, anglicized version of Jacob from the Hebrew Bible. He was well, very well known in the early church. Um, servant, let's talk about that word. Not a slave, but it's a servant. And this particular Greek word is a designation of honor within a household or with an administration, a servant. It was used also to describe um, Israel's great leaders in the Hebrew Bible. So that's a that's an honorific term, and it's not the same thing as slave. It's different. Servant is more a designation of honor. And then the other interesting thing is that that phrase that he uses to describe himself is the only time it's ever used in the New Testament, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there are different ways that that is stated in the New Testament, but in the letter of James, it just says a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only place it occurs. So some interesting little factoids there. And then he says, this letter or is going to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The 12 tribes in the dispersion. What in the world is he talking about? There is no real consistent consensus among scholars with this. Um, some believe he, he just, he's talking about the Jews, that uh, the, the believing Jews, the, belie the, the Jews who believe Jesus was the Messiah, that those who fled Jerusalem because of growing persecution of the early Christians who went out into the countryside. Or it simply means the Jewish people who were living in the countryside, the country people. 
Um, it's a sort of a general letter, not just to his congregation in Jerusalem, but letter, but but really he's he's looking and calling himself the Bishop of Jerusalem, and I'm speaking to the countryside. So there's no real consensus. But that that term, the twelve tribes of the dispersion, that comes right from the Hebrew Bible, it, it, when we're talking about the people of God, and of course in this sense, uh, James is considering the people of God those those who are now that the church is the extension of the original 12 tribes of Israel and there are some scholars who think that this whole thing the whole first verse was just a later edition that it wasn't even present in the original manuscript and that may not have been a letter at all it was just a way to uh, uh, gain accountability to say it belonged to James we don't know for sure so the second little section of of the first chapter uh, speaks to the place of trials in a believer's life and the purposes of God, the place of difficult times. He begins with a, a, a very Christian phrase, brothers and sisters, didn't hear that a lot among the Jewish uh, people, but the Christians use that a lot, brothers and sisters of Jesus. And he said that when they are experiencing difficult times, they, he uses the word trials, but difficult times, they should they should respond with joy. They should live in joy. And you think, why in the world would someone be joyous in the face, face of difficult issues and difficult times? And it seems that James says again, these are moments of opportunity. These are windows of opportunity. These are liminal spaces, as some people are calling, calling them, uh, opportunities for real growth deepening of faith and positive change. So he said, when those trials come, as I've said before, sometimes the only time we really change for the better is after we have really hit bottom or when things are really difficult. And so James says, when those are happening, just know, uh, be, be joyous because you're going to grow deeper in your faith. He says also, <clears throat> when you need help and guidance, uh, another way of talking about the wisdom of God when you don't have it within yourself, he said that's when you must ask God. You must reach out and ask God for the help and the guidance. But he says, do it trusting with faith. You have to have faith. And so you say, well, what does that mean? Have faith, have faith in what or in whom? I think what he means is this. You ask for God's help, trusting number one, or having this conviction in your heart that what that God is good, God is pure goodness, and that God wants the best for us. And so you, you have to ask for that help, trusting that this is who God is all about. And if God wants the best for us, God wants to help us, and that's why we can ask. So ask in faith. And he said, those who doubt in all this, who doubt that you know, maybe there is a dark side to God, maybe there's a part of God that isn't so good and loving and kind, they're the doubters. And when bad times come, we hear people say, oh, I don't know why God is doing this to me. Why blah. That's what I think James is calling the doubters. And he said, don't think like that. Think of God only as pure goodness who does not send calamity or temptation, but helps us through them. God is good and God wants the best for us. And also he said that people who are tend to have a lot of wealth or power, um, when those difficult times come for them, because they, those difficult times also have implications for their wealth and their power, he said they're, they're blown about like waves of the sea. And those who have little, have little to lose, and so they trust in God more. Again, he states, temptation does not come from God. Temptation does not come from God. Temptation comes from inner desire gone awry. Inner desire for something or someone that just goes out of control. That's temptation. And then finally he said, remember that God gives good gifts. All good gifts have their origin in God and God's character does not change. So therefore we have to trust in that. We have faith in God's character and we must imitate the, the, the goodness of God and trust that the image of God is in us be concerned for others and for their well-being. So when all that's going on, trust in, in this, this kind of uh, really good theology.
Now, the, the other half of the first chapter deals with what I'm going to call a, a vital Christian life. That is, there's two aspects to it. There's contemplation and there's action. And he discusses this in verses 19 through 27. And he says, you know, listening is key. Listening for this living word of God. Most of us love to pray and tell God what's going on and tell God how to do God's business. And James is telling us clearly, you need to listen. Listen is the key to hearing and knowing this living word of God. Be quick to listen, he says, and slow to speak. Okay, so the, the second aspect of <clears throat> vital Christian living is action. The, fir the first part is listening and praying and contemplation, meditating upon God to receive that word. The second part is action. That is, as James says, doing the word or application of the word. Um, the old phrase, uh, having your walk match your talk. Another way to talk about obedience to the word, that is doing it. Um, so listening for, the, for this living word and then doing it with our lives. And then finally, one of James's controversial uh, statements at the end of chapter one, he said, for example, one way of doing the word or applying the word, uh, what he calls pure religion, is taking care of those most vulnerable. And he mentions widows and orphans. Actually caring for them, seeing to their needs, that was one example of truly doing the word, pure religion. And that got him into some trouble with um, theologians like Luther and Calvin. And we'll talk about that uh, in the following videos. So I hope that helps. So next week we'll look at chapters two and three. God bless and have a great week.